Minister to introduce your presenter for today, Robert Yang. Robert is an international presenter on nutrition, corrective exercise and sports performance, and he's joining us today all the way from sunny California. Robert uses integrative and individualised programs to help clients improve performance, health and vitality while prevent injuries. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Robert Yang. Thanks, Chantal, for the uh, great introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Inflammation, Drugs, and Food. I'm sure all of you have come across all sorts of conditions, such as plantar fasciitis, bursitis of the, the hips, the shoulders, any sort of musculoskeletal injuries with your clients, with your athletes, uh, regardless of whether you're a corrective exercise or a strength coach. And I'm sure some of you personally have dealt with some of these conditions. Maybe your clients have dealt with these conditions as well. And all of these conditions that we're going to talk about today and that you probably have seen or your clients have gone to the doctor for all have one common theme, and that is inflammation. So hopefully today, when you guys leave this lecture, you will leave with why? Why is there inflammation going on with a client? Why is it not getting better? Two, what does it really look like? And three, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to educate your client? Because ultimately, we're all coaches. Uh, I am a nutritionist, but I also am in the trenches with all of you in regards to working with clients, athletes, on a one-to-one -one basis, on a daily basis. I have my own private studio in San Diego, and I see athletes on a capacity and regular general pop clients with uh, all sorts of conditions uh, ranging from digestive to even musculoskeletal injuries. Now, before we get into the lecture, as all the speakers have, have talked about, we're trying to reconnect with people, connect with new people. So let's connect. Let's talk about it. Uh, if you don't want to, if you want to say something about me you don't like it, that, that nutritious Robert Yang doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a wanker, this and that. Do whatever you like. But let's, let's interact on Twitter. Let's interact on Facebook. And let's get a conversation going through these three days. Because ultimately what it is is this is where the best minds meet with all of you where we can interact and learn from each other. Because I will learn from you just as much as you'll learn from me. So let's connect. Let's interact uh, through these three days and continue to keep the conversation going. So anytime that you see an ITIS, so it could be plantar fasciitis, like I said before, it could be bursitis, it could be colitis, it could be diverticulitis. Any sort of condition that you see with the ITIS means there's some kind of inflammation going on within the body. It could be more musculoskeletal that all of you that are used to seeing, or it could be the client comes, you say, you know what, you know, I've been having so much digestive problems and you know, the doctor says, I might have diverticulitis or I might have ulcerative colitis. So anytime you see an ITIS, it's a sign there's some kind of inflammation going on. It could be localized or it could be more total body, what we call systemic inflammation. Inflammation is, the literal definition is a non-specific response to cell injury. So on the cellular level, it is an injury to the cells, to the cellular structure. That's what inflammation is. Now, typically, we think about inflammation. We think about someone spraining their ankles. So the classic signs that you're going to see are going to be redness. It might be some heat that's going on. It's going to be pain. There's going to be swelling. That's why we use the RICE acronym as REST. we got the eyes compression and elevation. So these are common sorts of uh, inflammatory processes that we see that are normal in the body. So I don't want you to come away from this presentation saying, well, inflammation is bad. Inflammation needs to occur in the body. As you'll see, it's when inflammation gets out of control that it can drive a lot of the chronic diseases that we see in the world, as well as what you guys are seeing maybe in the gym with musculoskeletal injuries. So you're going to see signs of redness, swelling. You're going to see inflammation going on uh, within a specific joint. Uh, let's say someone who's sprained their ankle. Now, in general, in regards to the inflammatory process, when it's about three days to about 30 days, that's what we classify as an acute inflammatory response. That's normal. That's what should happen. The problem is when it becomes chronic. 
So that's when we're starting to get into that 30 to 60 day mark where the inflammation continues uh, on a day to day basis. So the ankle injury still has swelling. There's still pain to the touch. Uh, there's still issues that are going on. And what's interesting is that you can have this vicious cycle going on. So if we take that example of the person who injures their ankle and sprains it, they first get that acute inflammatory response. Eventually, if they don't take care of it, it can turn to more of a chronic issue. Now, the inflammation that occurs within the body, as you'll see later on the lecture, can be due to a lot of the lifestyle factors of your clients. So whether they're sleeping at the appropriate time, are they eating the appropriate foods, or could they be eating what we consider to be healthy foods, but really are creating an inflammatory response within the body and driving this issue. So it becomes chronic, and then there's a whole wide, whole body systemic inflammation that continues to occur and continues to drive the issue. Many times I'll see clients who are seeing the massage therapist, they're seeing the ART specialist, seeing Graston, they're going to the acupuncture, they're going through the ortho, they're going to physio, but yet they're still not getting better. And I'm sure all of you have one or two clients or maybe more clients that have those issues that continue to progress and get worse even though they're doing the right physical therapy, the physical modalities that we think would take care of an injury. Robbins, he says that it is chronic inflammation that is always destructive to tissues and it equated with disease. And you'll see that reoccurring theme within functional medicine, for example. So you'll see that with cardiovascular disease, that it's not just cholesterol that may be the issue, but the driving cause, the etiology of the problem is inflammation. Later on, uh, I think I present fat as your friend. Uh, I think it's on the last day. And I talk about that inflammation issue that is really the major drive of a lot of the cardiovascular disease that we're seeing that it's not just fat that's the problem, but there's the inflammation response that really is the issue and the key to the problem. So it's very similar to leaving your light bulbs in your apartment or your house. If you left for work, you work with clients 8 to 10 hours a day, and you just left the lights on, eventually light bulbs will burn out over a period of time. In the same way, with inflammation in our bodies, a lot of our clients are not turning the lights off. They're continually living a lifestyle or eating foods that are causing this inflammatory response within the body. So what I'm going to show you guys is later how to turn off that switch, how to turn off that inflammatory response that continues to drive a lot of these conditions that we're seeing. As fitness professionals, we're in the business of making our clients look better, feel better. Uh, as we've just learned from Matt Church, is that ultimately we've got to be the ultimate public speakers. We have to be motivated people within our industry, not just all about the body. And what you'll come away with in this lecture is just simple strategies that you can implement in your lifestyle if you have inflammatory conditions, as well as in your client, to really help put out the fire, so to speak, in in regards to inflammation. A lot of our clients, as you can see with the slide, they have aches and pains. They have a low back issue, or they might have sciatic pain, or they have a bum shoulder, or they might have headaches that are dull and they're every day, or they might even progress to migraines. And what is oftentimes the case with a lot of these clients is they typically will respond by using some kind of medication. And typically, it's aspirin, for example, with headaches. Uh, we know with aspirin, uh, it is effective. It does take away the pain. But one of the side effects of aspirin is you can get a bleeding ulcer over a period of time. I've had one client who was taking about 10 aspirins a day and wondered why his stomach hurt. Uh, this is a driving issue. Most of our clients don't have the capacity, or they, they just don't think, they don't correlate oh, I may have a stomach issue because I'm taking too much aspirin or pain medication. Aspirin is what we classify as a cyclooxygenase 1 inhibitor, COX-1 inhibitor. But the problem is, with any medication that you do take, there are always side effects that occur with that medication. 
and the side effects is on the gastric mucosa. So that's why people will end up having a bleeding ulcer if they take aspirin for long enough period of time. The other ones is are the anti-inflammatory medications. So some of you are probably aware of some of the anti-inflammatory meds uh, like uh, Vioxx that was available. It's no longer available. Uh, Celebrex is probably the, one of the most well-known uh, anti-inflammatory medications for arthritis, for osteoarthritis. But as with aspirin, there are also side effects with those type of medications. The way that they were created was they wanted to find a medication where they wouldn't have any side effects with the digestive system. The only problem is these are classified as COX-2 inhibitors. The problem is the cyclogenase 2, what they do, the enzymes, is they're very important for blood clotting. And what ends up happening is one of the side effects is stroke. So when they came out with Biox, it was a great drug. It took away all the pain. But the problem is with a lot of these medications that we see, whether it's Vioxx, the anti-inflammatory meds, or you look at, for example, one of the biggest meds that people are using are for reflux. So people are having stomach pain, they're having cramping, uh, and so they're prescribed a lot of these anti-acid uh, medications. The problem is they're designed for you to only take for a very short period of time, not for months at a time, not for years at a time. But the issue with Vioxx, when they started using it, people were using for years and years upon times. So what ends up happening is people were getting strokes. They were getting blood clots, thickening of the blood, and that was causing a stroke. They had another side effect that was a bit serious, and that was death. Uh, so that's why, if you look at the history of Vioxx, it was taken off the market. But unfortunately, many people had died. Probably about 250,000 people have died. Uh, from Vioxx. And unfortunately, it was improved when it should have been, uh, but unfortunately, that's the side effect of it. There was um, complication with stroke, cardiovascular disease, uh, and simply death. And these are just the people that were using it that had arthritic symptoms as well as osteoarthritis. So there's a whole slew of other people that were using the medication that were not having these musculoskeletal problems. So these are the, some of the things that we're facing within the fitness industry Although we may think of it as a separate issue, but a lot of our clients are using these sorts of pain meds to get through the day or get through a workout. Uh, I work with a lot of golfers. They tend to use a lot of these medications on a daily basis in order to play golf. But with these medications, especially with these COX-2 inhibitors, they are a double-edged sword. So they do work. So don't get me wrong. They do work. They take away the pain. The only problem is with these medications, with the COX-2s, what they do is they also eat up the cartilage. And they don't allow the cartilage to uh, regenerate. So that's one of the big problems with some of these COX-2 inhibitors that are available. They do work, but the side effects is that it's, it's a catch-22. They're taking away the pain, but they're also making it worse in the long run because they're eating the cartilage. And I'm always into looking at the big picture of things, as should all of you, because ultimately, we don't want people to be in pain or out of pain just for six months and then be in pain for another six months to a year in the same way that we don't want them to lose weight for six months and then gain the weight back and then some the next six months. So we always want to look at the big picture in regards to how our clients progress and if they can maintain that, in my opinion, for a lifetime. We typically think of Medications as prescriptions, the, you know, the Celebrex, the Vioxx, as more dangerous than the over-the-counter medi medications. So you look at ibuprofen, it's over-the-counter, so it should be safe. And we also look at acetaminophen. Now, that's another medication as well. And that's also considered safe. But really, if you look at the research, it's quite scary to look at what happens to a lot of people using these medications. Uh, there's plenty of research looking at the toxicity of the kidneys. Uh, that's a big one. For all of you that are in the fitness industry uh, and maybe are performing uh, or using uh, supplements like creatine, be wary. So if your client or your athlete's going through an injury, but they're also using creatine, just a side note, you have to be careful with those athletes using creatine because it puts excessive stress on the kidneys. So if an athlete comes, you say, I've been using ibuprofen or I'm using uh, Advil or any of the, the uh, acetaminophens, you want to make sure that you take them off of creatine or give them a break from it because you could potentially uh, risk uh, damage to the kidneys. 
Uh, the other part of the side effects is with the liver. So right now in this day and age in all over the world, especially in the United States and also Australia, is that we're having issues with the liver. We're having, we have what you all probably have heard about alcoholic liver disease, but we're also having non-alcoholic fatty liver disease where people don't drink alcohol, but yet their livers are full of toxins and they have an incapacity to detoxify their body. And when you throw on pain meds, ibuprofen, you throw in acetaminophen, what tends to happen is that you're throwing gasoline to the fire and making it worse. And you could potentially do a lot of harm and damage to the liver. People don't know about fatigue, but that's probably one of the, I would say the number one complaint about why people go to the doctor is, doc, I'm tired and I'm fatigued. One of the side effects about or with acetaminophen is that it always had a side effect, and drugs always work on the enzyme system. So if you look at the way that acetaminophen works is that it inhibits an enzyme called HMG coi reductase. Uh, it's an enzyme that's produced in the body. It's natural. And the way enzymes work, real simple, to keep it uh, not complicated, is it's a lock and key. So when they take acetaminophen, it's that key that goes in the lock and locks that enzyme from working. Well, I'm sure all of you have heard about CoQ10, coenzyme Q10. It's very, very important for our bodies in regards to production of energy. Your body makes energy on the cellular level with CoQ10. When people take acetaminophen, it locks that enzyme from working, hmg coi reductase, your body can't re produce CoQ10 anymore. With all of you that exercise, with our clients that exercise, exercise is a means of producing CoQ10 within the cells. But when people are taking this medication, acetaminophen, uh-uh, it doesn't happen. So that's why a lot of times your clients may come to you fatigued, tired, or maybe possibly peter out during exercise session because they just don't have the capacity to make coenzyme Q10 within their body because it's a side effect of the medication they're taking. So at one point, if you don't do it already, as fitness professionals, you should have some sort of client forms that they fill out before they come see you as a new client. So you should know, are they taking these medications? What are they taking? It's not your job to tell them whether to take it or not, but you do need to be aware of them because that could impact your exercise program in regards to their reps, their sets, their tempo, their intensity, uh, their Every, all the exercise variables, it'll affect it. Now, with these pain meds, as I said before, they do work because they do take away the pain. And I want to give you guys a simple analogy that you can use with your clients. And it really, the light bulbs go off when the client hears this, when they take a lot of these pain meds. Let's say, for example, my buddy drives up and he just bought the new RS4. I'm a, I'm a big Audi fan. I love Audis. I love fast cars. So he says, Rob, got the new RS4. Let's go. I'm like, I'm in. We're going down the highway, 120 miles an hour. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the check engine light goes on. And I said, oh, hey, buddy, just, just pull over to the side of the road. And he goes, okay. And I popped. I said, pop the hood. I go underneath the hood. And so what I do is I go to that little, little wire underneath the hood, and I click the wire, and the check engine light goes off. He goes, bro, what'd you do? I said, oh, don't worry about it. We're good to go. Light's not on, is it? No. So he's, all right. Bah! What's going to happen down the road? You get the picture. Engine's going to blow. And what ends up happening is that people take these pain meds. Yes, it does take away the pain. But with pain, any of you that have are performing corrective exercise or uh, physio, you know that pain is a sign that there's something wrong. So if someone squats, they do a front squat, they go down, and they go, oh, you know what? I, I have this pain that's just traveling down through my glute, and it's kind of going down to my foot and making my big toe numb. Is that a problem? I would say yes, it is a problem. So do we continue loading the bar and getting up to two plates on each side and then go to even more than that? No, we've got to stop them because there's something wrong. But what these pain meds do is it masks the pain completely, and then you can drive that pain and make the, the issue worse at hand. So be aware with these pain meds. 
There are some alternatives, which I will go over towards the end of the lecture, uh, to give you some, some alternatives. Because obviously, uh, they are freely available, all these payments, whether they're prescription or over-the-counter. Uh, but there are some good alternatives uh, that you can use on yourself as, with, as well as with your clients. Some of the driving issues in regards to inflammation, uh, three of them, usually three of them. And one of them is, is physical uh, drivers of inflammation. And one of the physical drives is low back pain. So I'm sure all of you have somebody who has low back pain. They come to you with low back pain, or they might get low back pain during exercise session. 33% of the population has low back pain. Every person in the world will probably have one bout of low back pain in their lifetime. That's the stat. So it's something that we have to deal with all the time, and it can be quite debilitating because whether it's a disc derangement, whether it's a spondylolisthesis, spondylolisthesis, spinal stenosis, um, SI joint dysfunction, uh, whatever it is, it can drive uh, inflammation going up, and it can be acute to begin with, but it can be more chronic over a period of time because we hear about people having low back pain for years and years uh, in their lifetime. It's not just one bout. They usually get bouts of it over and over again. So we have to be cognizant about the low back pain and the musculoskeletal pains that people will have. Endurance training. Some of the endurance athletes may not like me when I say this, but endurance training can be a creator of inflammation. Now, if you're an athlete who is running you know, a 5K, a 10K, you want to run a marathon, that's fine. But if the purpose of you performing endurance training is for cardiovascular health, and it's just for fat burning, and overall you just want to reduce some body weight, then endurance training may not be the most optimal form of exercise. We know through short interval training that it's just as effective, sometimes even more effective than just straight endurance training. Uh, what I'm against is not endurance training, but the overtraining of endurance athletes. I see it constantly in my office where endurance athletes, and you know it, uh, with a lot of the endurance athletes, they have chronic upper respiratory tract infections. So whenever you have a chronically Im depressed immune system, you will have some type of inflammatory process going on. And classically, you see this. I mean, I come from San Diego, so it's, it's sunny all the time. It's, it's beautiful like it is here. And I drive on the coast looking for surf all the time, and you see the runners going by, and they got a, a ankle brace, and they got the, the cho pat, right, two of them, and then they're just hobbling along and, and running, and they're doing, I mean, literally, there's one guy walking down my, running down my street, and this is how he runs. <laughs> I mean, that's his routine. And with endurance training, it can be very addictive because we get the endorphin release, we get those hormone releases that people love to have. Uh, but we do have to be aware of the volume and intensity because usually it's the volume, not so much the intensity, that becomes a problem with endurance athletes. And as you know, you can have endurance athletes that chronically will run with plantar fasciitis and all sorts of other iliotibial band syndrome until they just can't do it anymore. Posture is another thing. Our body is not designed to sit for eight hours a day. That's not what our body is designed to do. But unfortunately, the workplace, probably 80% of the workplace, is seated. So if you have people that are CEOs or computer programmers or attorneys, they're seated all day long. So if we take, for example, that person with low back pain on that previous slide, they are harmfully going to induce some pain within the disc, SI joint, because they're seated all day long. And you take a scenario of a typical client they get up in the morning, and they get in the car, and they drive maybe 30 minutes an hour to work. And then they sit for 8 to 10 hours a day at work. Then they drive back for another hour. And then what do most people do at night? They're either surfing the Internet or they're watching TV. They're seated. Now, granted, a lot of our clients, they're coming to see us one, two, maybe three times a week. But we have to educate our clients on the ergonomics. So all of you should do this if you don't do it already. If you have clients that are mostly in the seated position at their workplace, you need to go there as a service, free of charge, and check their ergonomics. It's very simple. All you have to do is look at them from the side. They're seated. This should be 90 degrees at the hips and knees. 
And this is the most important part of checking someone's ergonomics. When they're looking this way and they're looking at the screen, where the middle of the screen is with their line of vision, it should be about, I would say, about 15 to 30 inches away from their eyes. Uh, sorry, I can't figure that out in the metric system. But uh, you get the idea. Because oftentimes people are looking down like this all the time, and that's affecting their posture. And if you can do that, you can make a huge difference in regards to their pain and inflammation. Just do the math. If you think about the person who drives an hour, that's one hour. Eight hours a day, that's nine hours. And then an hour back, that's 10 hours. And they sit and watch TV for 12 hours. 12 hours a day, five days a week, that's 60 hours. And let's say most of our clients see us three times a week for an hour. Three times a week of corrective exercise is never going to defeat 60 hours of doing this. So we have to check at ergonomics. Their posture is only as good as the way they're seated and they're standing when they're away from us. Oftentimes, most of our clients, they don't get hurt when they're with us. They get hurt when they're away from us doing other things. So make sure you check their ergonomics. Yes, the iPhones, or not just the iPhones, but all the texting that we see. Remember, texting is doing this. I mean, I've seen kids, people do that for hours and hours upon planes. They don't move. If you look at a study they did uh, years ago uh, by Harms Rigdahl, they put someone in a forehead posture position. So simply doing this. Within 2 to 15 minutes, people started complaining of neck pain. Within about 57 minutes, none of the subjects wanted to continue because the pain was too much. They wanted to stop the study. What's really surprising about the study is that four days later, people still complained of pain in their neck from that one bout. And people are literally doing that for hours at a time every, every day. So be aware of these devices and educate your clients. Yeah, it's not very cool to do that, but it's much better to do that to eventually have a lower cervical disc bulge and cause all sorts of pain and inflammation. The other part of the study that was interesting is that they put electrodes on the muscles, and they wanted to see how much activity were, were actually on the muscles, and there was zero activity on the muscles. So what that means is that, that all that tension and all that stress was going into the ligamentous structures in the lower cervical spine. And all of you know, if you take a six-pack of beer, at least when I was younger, you had the plastic rings, and you take the beer out, can you put the beer back in, the plastic rings? You can't. And it's the same thing with your joints and ligaments. Once they're stretched, it's gone. You can't get that back at all. So now all you're relying is on the muscle tissue. So be aware with these devices and everything that we do have because it can really be a driver of that pain and inflammation. Now, all you bench press fanatics, uh, there, there's a term that was coined by Paul Cech is the pattern overload syndrome. You typically see it in chronic bench pressers. You will also see it with people that only do the Smith machine. So they only do Smith machine back squats. They only do Smith machine incline presses. And if you look at any elite weightlifter with doing a snatch or clean and jerk, the bar path from the side is always slightly different on each movement pattern. So you must start your clients on different types of exercise, not doing the same exercise patterns all the time. This is when you get into this uh, pattern overload syndrome. So get them to do different variations of exercise, even if it's different from a flat bench to an incline bench to an overhead press. Those are all different motor patterns. They may be similar, but neurologically, they are different types of exercises. Looks pretty good. Oh! This is a driver of inflammation, injury. This guy looked pretty good, but he should have got away from the bar completely. I teach Olympic lifting. I have a two-day course that I teach. And the first and foremost thing that you teach in a weightlifter is get out of the way. And some people say, oh, well, how can you spot him? Well, if you want a Alico plate printed on your forehead, then you're going to spot that person. There's no spotting in weightlifting in Olympic-style weightlifting. So be aware, if a client is not physically ready and capable to perform the exercise, we've got to back them away. 
as coaches, we have to, we're very excited as a profession. We want to push our clients. We want to get them to do the advanced exercises because that's the sexy stuff. But oftentimes, we need to hold our clients back, and we need to coach them properly so we can prevent situations like this. Because I guarantee you this guy, he's going to be in pain for weeks on end. Scars are another one. So I'm sure for those of you that are working with uh, women that have either C-sections or it could be an appendectomy, any sort of scar. It could be on the abdominal wall. It could be on the knee joint. But scars are a form of inflammation and pain. Whenever the skin is cut, what ends up happening is the body wants to always heal that. So you scratch yourself, and over a period of time, your body lays down, and you get the scab, becomes itchy, and eventually falls off, and then you have new skin. With scars, what's happening is during that scarring process, the body will end up forming trigger points within the scar tissue. So oftentimes, I've worked on uh, scar tissue that's 30 years old, and there are places that are numb. There are places that have acute trigger points, that have pain and inflammation. And they can, this can drive a lot of pain and inflammation within the body, especially we know about the core and how important that is between the lower extremity and the upper extremity. It's very important that we take care of these scar tissues. So whether it's out of your scope, you have a referral process, if someone has scars, you need to get that addressed with a proper massage therapist or a rolfer, uh, someone who's uh, educated and has the ability and skills to address this because you'll probably try to exercise someone's abdominal wall till the cows go home and they won't respond. They'll still have a pooch belly. They'll still have all these different things because what's inherently happening is that there's pain and inflammation. And in the presence of pain and inflammation, the body will not want to fire those muscles underneath that scar. They will be inhibited until that pain and inflammation is taken away. Now, chemicals are a driving force for inflammation as well. We are constantly surrounded by chemicals. And you'll know more uh, when I talk about that in my detox presentation. That's going to be in a few days. But with chemicals, we do have to be aware of all the pesticides, the herbicides, chemicals, fertilizers that are grown on our food. They are massive inflammatory agents. They are designed to be a disruptor of our hormones. Essentially, that's how pesticides are designed. So they want to design so that the hormones are disrupted, so the pesticides can't reproduce. And guess what happens when we eat that pesticide or that residue? It causes hormonal disruption. And anytime you cause hormonal disruption, you will cause some type of inflammatory response within the body somewhere down the chain. Plastics are another one. These days, we have plastics everywhere. Everything's packaged in plastic, our water, our food, uh, even in the water supply. Unfortunately, if you look, start to look at some of the animals that are living in the water, uh, the crocodiles in Florida and, and all these other animals, the whales are having, the males are having smaller penises because there's so much estrogen within the water. And you're also seeing that within the young males that are being born as well. So we have to be really, really careful about these plaques in our water because they can drive some of these hormonal dysfunctions as well as inflammation within the body. Perfumes and colognes. You know those clients that walk in the door and you can smell them coming in. They pour about half the bottle of cologne or perfume on their body. You give them a hug and you smell like them the rest of the day. Uh, perfumes are quite toxic to the body. You're inhaling it. You're going through the lungs. So you're inflaming the lungs whenever you're inhaling that sort of uh, fragrance. There's probably about, at worst, 400 different chemicals in one perfume or cologne. That's a lot, a lot of different chemicals and toxins within the body that really creates that inflammatory response. Now, sugar. We look at these different forms of sugar, cane sugar. We look at organic sugar. Uh, it's a running joke with a lot of my clients. They go, well, you want me to eat organic, so I'm going to go eat organic sugar. Well, sugar is still sugar, whether it's organic or not. And sugar is one of the probably most inflammatory uh, foods that we consume uh, in the world. For on average, a person is probably consuming about 80 kilos of sugar a year. And for all of us that are quite fit, that eat quite well, that don't eat sugar, that means the next person is probably 
eating double that. And that's why one of the reasons why you have such an epidemic of obesity and a lot of these inflammatory conditions uh, that are occurring. Uh, a lot of people are taking prednisone and all sorts of other anti-inflammatory drugs because they have this massive amount of inflammation running through their body. So it doesn't matter what a person does in regards to their physical therapy or their corrective exercise or their active isolated stretching, acupuncture. Systemically, they're driving the issue by what, in their, what they're putting in their mouth because the sugar consumption is so high. And it's, it's a chronic problem that I'm seeing uh, from the younger population as well as to our older populations as well. The sugar consumption is so high uh, within a lot of our clients. Medical drugs are another one. So the stats usually say about 80% of the population is on one medication. And with any medication that a someone is taking, it will cause an inflammatory response within the digestive tract. That's just proven. So any time that you irritate the intestinal tract, you have the potential to cause a whole body, that systemic inflammation that I talked about earlier. And unfortunately, most people are taking medications to take care of symptoms, but in the long run, they're causing more problems uh, down the road. So be aware with some of these medications. Obviously, we're in the position where we can't tell our clients not to take it or to take it, but what you can do is you can educate your clients uh, about the different side effects. Uh, for those of you that are into apps, uh, one of the easiest apps that you can get is called Epocrates. So it's spelled E-P-O-C-R-A-T-E-S. And you can type in any medication, the trade name or the popular name, and everything will pop up from all the side effects or adverse reactions, um, any of the research that has been done on it. And you can, and I think it's a free app right now, and you can get the updated version and pay for a few bucks to get that. But everybody has a cell phone these days. So you have it at the edge of your fingertips to get information, and you can say, look, this is the side effects of these medications. Talk to your doctor about them. See if they can reduce your dosage or they need to get you on something else. Um, ultimately, I'm going to give you some guidance about how to deal with inflammation uh, with simple things like water and, and food and, and different herbals and supplements that you can use that are easily available and that actually work. Because oftentimes, a research paper may come out and we think, oh, great, this is going to be the next new thing, and then you implement it clinically, it doesn't really do much. Um, makes me think about, I don't know if you guys that are into strength and training, uh, HMB, HMG, is a hydroxymethyl uh, butyrate. I can't remember the last name, but uh, that was supposed to tout as a new creatine, but it ended up really flopping, and we didn't receive much results with that particular product. But I will get into that uh, as we get towards the end of the lecture. Grains. We have been told for years upon years upon years upon years to eat lots of grains. Lots of grains are healthy for us. They're going to make us poop better, they're going to prevent heart attacks, they're going to prevent diabetes. But what I end up finding is that the more grains that people consume, especially the gluten-type grains, you will drive inflammation within the body. Uh, it goes back to the intestinal tract, and it will drive inflammation within the intestinal tract. Uh, some people are married to grains. And the classic sign that you know that somebody should be reducing their grain consumption is if they say, Robert... I will die if I give up bread. I cannot give up bread. I love it. I cannot give it up. Usually the cravings that people have are an indication that they are intolerant to the food, that their body doesn't like it. So just remember that when you're talking to a client, those are just key words that you can listen to to know that they probably shouldn't be eating that food. Um, there are other components of grain that can be a problem, but... To say the least, the, the grains can be a major driver of inflammation within the body. And then simply just processed foods. If people have a poor, poor diet where they're eating lots of processed foods, that's going to create a huge imbalance within the omega-6s, which you guys all heard about, versus omega-3s. So what ends up happening is that because of the processed foods have high amounts of omega-6s, that drives the ratio up. So now you're having more of what research shows is a 20 to 1 ratio, omega-6 to omega-3. And what that does is that drives inflammation. So typically, omega-6s 
are essential. Your body needs them, and you need to eat them. But the typical standard diet that most of our clients are eating, uh, maybe someone that's over, overweight or obese, uh, tends to drive uh, the omega-6s up, which creates more of an inflammatory response uh, within the body. And most people don't eat enough omega-3s. Typically, omega-3s are fish um, or um, you know, things like liver, guts, uh, fish guts, fish eyeballs. Those have high amounts of uh, omega-3s, but most of our clients aren't going to eat them. I know I won't eat a fish eyeball, but <laughs> um, some uh, other cultures, they, that's a delicacy, but they have high amounts of omega-3s. Alcohol. All right. You can leave now, or you can get your tomatoes if you like your alcohol. But alcohol has been supposedly shown to be our healthy beverage. You should have one glass of wine at night because it's heart healthy. Uh, in my opinion, uh, people should not be drinking alcohol. Some of you may not like that statement, but the reason being is that alcohol is the most it's the fastest digesting substance we can ever consume. That's why you'll see all the NyQuil's and the medications laced with alcohol because it gets into the system really, really quick, fast. That's why they like to use alcohol. The reason why it's a massive uh, driver of inflammation is that once you consume alcohol, it inflames the intestinal tract. So those of you who have, have alcohol or have a beer, you know that... Oftentimes, you feel bloated after you drink alcohol. Well, what that is is a sign that your intestinal tract is being inflamed. And the small intestine, if you don't know, it's a, a membrane of cells, but it's what we call a semi-permeable membrane. So what that means is that it has these junctions, and they're tightly closed, but whenever they're irritated and they're poked at and they're inflamed, they start to open up this way. And that's what we call leaky gut syndrome. And with alcohol consumption, it irritates the hell out of the intestinal tract. And it causes a self-induced leaky gut. So whatever you eat after you have alcohol, whether it's bread or cheese or ice cream or fish, well, that's getting straight into the bloodstream. The body is not designed to deal with that on a continuous basis. Every once in a while is normal, and your body has a capacity to close the gaps and deal with it. But when you're constantly inflaming the intestinal tract with alcohol consumption, what ends up happening is that you are inflaming the intestinal tract, and then you're allowing these food particles to get straight into the bloodstream. And what that does is anything that gets into the bloodstream without being sort of going through a security check when you go to the airport, that causes massive amounts of Pac-Man to come out, to Pac-Man to eat, eat up the foreign, foreigners within the blood. And that drives an immune response, which ultimately leads to false inflammation within the body. So alcohol really, in my opinion, is not something to, be, to consume. Especially at night, it drives your blood sugar up, disrupts your sleep pattern. It would be better to consume it in the morning, but if you do that, you've got some other issues, right? Um, but uh, there are other things about alcohol. We can talk about that later if you want, if you have questions at the end. But it really is not something to be consumed at, or looked at as something healthy to be added to someone's diet. Now, if someone wants to have a splurge and they just want a couple glasses of wine a weekend, not a big deal. But if it's used as something that's daily, that, oh, this is supposed to make me healthier, uh, that, that's a myth. That's a false uh, assumption. Now, vegan diets, uh, especially with a lot of your clients that you're dealing with that have musculoskeletal injuries, uh, long-term vegetarian and vegan diets can be a real issue. As I told you before, I work with uh, athletes and general pop clients in the musculoskeletal capacity as well with corrective exercise uh, and getting them to perform high performance exercise. And one of the problems that I see is that clients that are on vegetarian diets over a long period of time do not get enough protein intake. And there is no pool of amino acids within the body. You must replenish it on a daily basis. Just as there's no pool of water, you've got to drink water every day, otherwise you're going to run out, you're going to get dehydrated. In that same capacity, a lot of our clients are exercising. Maybe they're exercising three times a week. Maybe they're exercising every day. They're seeing you three times, and they're exercising the other days of the week. When we exercise, it is a catabolic process. It is not an anabolic process. That's one of the uh, 
kind of a misinformation. We think, oh, we're getting stronger in the gym. Yeah, you may be performing uh, more load on the squat bar or on the deadlift, but you're physically tearing down muscle tissue. You're creating a catabolic effect. And what ends up happening is because the protein intake is not high enough with these types of diets, what ends up happening is the body does not have the raw ingredients to replace muscle tissue, myofibrils, and also connective tissue. We forget to think about the connective tissue with the ligaments and the joints. <clears throat> uh, we need that protein intake in order for the ligamentous system to heal. Uh, primarily, uh, one of the amino acids is called proline. Uh, lysine is also involved in the cross-linkage of the cartilage, but proline is one of those amino acids you can only get in animal products, and it's very important for stability of the collagen. And I've seen this over and over with some of the vegetarians that I've seen is they don't heal as well from musculoskeletal injuries, especially joint injuries. Uh, just one interesting case study, I had a young uh, African-American basketball player, and he had a L5-S1 disc bulge at the age of 15, 15 or 16. Uh, that's unheard of for someone that young to usually have a disc bulge, unless there's some kind of uh, extreme amount of trauma that occurs. And, and literally, this kid would walk down the court, and he would sprain his ankles. But yet, he was so fast, he could dunk a basketball at only 5'8", five, 5'7". Five, that's pretty good. That means you got some good hops. So he could be explosive, but yet he couldn't stabilize his joints, and he would sprain his ankles walking on the court sometimes or running really fast. I ended up finding out this kid has been raised as a vegetarian, as a vegan, since the time he was born because his mother thought that was the healthiest thing to do. Uh, unfortunately, this kid was raised on soy burgers and soy milk and never ate meat in his entire life. I remember this distinctly, too. I said, well, you know, when the team travels, they don't go to a nice restaurant and sit down. They go to places like McDonald's or Burger King or whatever is available. I said, so what do you do when you go to uh, McDonald's? What do you eat? Because all those burgers and fries. He goes, well, I eat the fries. I go, okay, well, that's a given. And, and they get a Big Mac. And I said, well, Big Mac has meat in it. He goes, I get a Big Mac, but without the meat. I'm like, that's not too appetizing <laughs> when you think about that. But that's what this kid would do. And until I got this kid starting to eat a little bit of some animal products, uh, he would constantly, he would not heal properly. So uh, just be aware that if your clients are not healing properly and their protein intake is very, very low or they're on a very extreme vegan, vegetarian diet, you have to start exploring that and at least supplementing their diet, if not giving them um, some different type of animal products because uh, it will definitely accelerate their healing process. A third source of inflammation is microbiologic. It's something we typically don't want to think about, and you don't really think about it. It's kind of gross to think about it. But with bacteria, you ha we have to think about bacteria. And the reason being is that with bacteria, we all walk around with about three to four pounds of bacteria within our body, our digestive system. If you were to take a scratch of your skin and put it under the microscope and look underneath the microscope, you would see hundreds of bacteria. When I went to a holistic dentist, they took a scrape of my tooth and they put it on a microscope. I almost freaked out. There were literally hundreds of bacteria on the screen. I'm like, did you just replace that with someone else's saliva? He said, no, that's yours. I go, no, that can't be. I'm a nutritionist. I eat clean. I do all these different things. So no, 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 that's, that's normal. Uh, you should have bacteria. Well, when we have an overgrowth of bacteria, uh, whether it's H. pylori, or whether it's a parasite, or whether it's fungus, or anything else, types of bacteria, uh, what ends up happening is that they want to survive too. They want to live too. So they're going to create toxins which become very inflammatory within the body. Candida, oral thrush, candida, fungus, yeast, that's another one. Um, they want to live too. So anytime they release their toxins, it's very, very inflammatory to the intestinal tract. And that can lead to what we call a kind of a stealth inflammatory res uh, response to the body. At least with let's say whether it's perfumes or the pesticides or whichever or all these other uh, creators of inflammation, we can at least go to sleep and we take a break from it. But if someone has an overgrowth of these sort of uh, bacteria or fungus or candida, it's with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and when you sleep, you still don't get a rest from it. So it's constantly driving inflammation. So that's why 
for those of you that are working with clients and they're complaining about, oh, man, I've got the, the shits all day, and I have bloating, and I have gas, I'm farting, I'm belching, um, I can't digest my food. I mean, you hear it. I mean, it, it's almost to the point where it's like TMI, with, like too much information. Because we're with a client an hour at a time. So they, I mean, some of you are probably close to some of your clients. They tell you lots of information. So when you start hearing this information, you need to form some kind of referral network around you where you have a naturopath or you have a nutritionist like myself that deals with these sorts of issues. That way, what's going to end up happening is your program and your results are going to be that much better. And the client's going to get better. They're going to lose fat, lose weight, deal with their inflammation issues. Uh, the gut flora is also something we need to consider, too. So that's why uh, there's a big push within the industry, within the food industry, uh, with probiotics. So like I said before, we walk around with about three to four pounds of bacteria within the digestive tract. And if there's an imbalance going on, it's what we call dysbiosis. And basically what it is is that we want the good guys winning the battle over the bad guys. When the bad guys start winning, that's when we have diarrhea, we have vomiting, we eat something bad, and that's when that triggers those types of responses. But overall, we want a good guys winning the battle over the bad guys. So that's why probiotics, in the long run, that's one way that you can deal with inflammation and help lower inflammation uh, within the body. Now, when it comes to inflammation, for those who don't know, do not know, cortisol is one of the hormones that helps your body deal with inflammation. It's produced by the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are about the size of a walnut, and they sit right above the kidneys. And they're responsible for dealing with stress. They're responsible for dealing with inflammation. Uh, when our blood sugar goes haywire, it drops too low. If someone doesn't eat breakfast, cortisol comes out, and it's being excreted to go to the rescue. So the adrenal glands are very, very small glands, but they're very, very, very important within the body in regards to dealing with inflammation. Now with stress, who in this room has zero stress, no stress? Raise your hand. Really? I have no stress. No, I actually had some stress. I had my slides are kind of messed up before, and I was scrambling to try to balance them out, and I had some stress going on. But what I want to tell you guys is this. So let's say, for example, this cup of water here is representing a client's stress load. I'm not saying that stress is bad for us because we have used stress, which is good stress, but we have distress, which can be quite harmful to the body. So when we take a, uh, a client to the gym, that's a stressor in itself. It's a physical stress. But we need to induce some of the stress so they can adapt and they can hypertrophy or create maximal strength or power, whatever your training effect that you want, right? But if someone's stress load is this high, and let's say, for example, uh, one of your male clients who runs a company or he's a president. So he wakes up, he's late. So there's a little bit of stress into the system. So it's up here. He gets in traffic, and then all of a sudden, someone cuts him off, gives him the birdie, kind of in a stressed state. He gets to the office. He's got meetings up the wazoo. Something's broken in the you know, manufacturing plant, whatever's going on. So the stress level goes up. And then his wife calls, says, honey, the toilet blew up. So we've got to call the plumber, foot of water in the house. Well, stress is going up again. So you can see it's starting to get to the edge. And then the school calls. Tommy got in a fight again. He hit a kid in the face. He's in the principal's office. So stress level goes up again. And then now he's starting to overflow. And that, excuse me, you guys get the picture. So it's not that stress is bad. It's just when stress is mismanaged and stress becomes too much and their cup is overflowing, that's when people get a lot of these inflammatory responses. It's, it's very similar to one of those clients. They say, oh, you know what, Rob? I went to go pick up my, my shoes, and I blew my back out. Was it the load of the shoe that blew their disc out? No, it was a bound to happen. It's just that that was the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. In the same way, with stress, it's usually that load of stress that people have that can drive a lot of these inflammatory issues that are going on. Because what ends up happening is that with cortisol production, 
whenever there's stress, the adrenals go, hey, we've got to go to the rescue and start to deal with that stress, whether it's mental, emotional, physical. I showed you guys chemical, all those different stressors. But remember, the job of the cortisol is to have a potent anti-inflammatory effect in the body. So we have to be wary of our client's stress level because if it's really, really high, you may not be able to load them with the type of exercise you want to load them when they come in the door. Because when they walk in the door of your gym or your studio or your, your yoga Pilates studio, where, whatever part of the industry that you're in, they don't leave all that baggage at the door. They're usually carrying it with them. So we do need to be aware of that and be careful and learn to, to bend and to possibly change our programs when they come in the door. Because sometimes they're so stressed out, if we induce more stress, we can possibly cause that inf inflammation to go up and cause our symptoms to increase. And these days, everybody's multitasking. Women are typically better multitaskers than men. My wife is a better, excuse me, multitasker than I am. But we tend to multitask with everything that we do. Uh, you know, with women, they're dealing with their kids, five kids, they're making dinner, they're doing the books, they're booking vacations, they're dealing with plumbers, they're doing all these different things. Um, and so there's constant cortisol that's being leaked out every single day in different areas. And that's not the body, that's not the way the body's been designed. I would say some of the key uh, stressors to the body is coffee consumption. And it could be coffee, it could be caffeine, it could be your fix is Red Bull, it could be Monster, it could be NOS, whatever your fix is. But caffeine can be one of those drivers of that inflammatory uh, process. And the reason being is that when you drink coffee, yes, you get energy from coffee. The problem is the adrenals have to handle that stress load, and over a period of time, it can stress out the adrenals more and more over a period of time because of the coffee consumption. And typically, for people that drink coffee, and that's the only way that they can get energy, what happens after maybe a couple weeks to a month of one cup of coffee? They get tired again. It doesn't do the job because they haven't fixed any of their other lifestyle. So what they have to do is they have to go to two cups of coffee to get the same effect. And then once that wears off, then they have to go to three cups of coffee. And once that wears off, they're doing pots of coffee a day. And they're still tired, but they end up being wired but tired. One of the absolute worst breakfast that you could ever consume is cereal. I don't care if it's organic this, organic gluten-free cereal, rice cereal, wheat cereal, it's the magic grain cereal, whatever it is. Cereal goes through a process called extrusion. And what that is is they use high heat, high, high heat and high pressure in order to make it so crunchy. And it can be a very addicting uh, type of food, but what it does is it dries up blood sugar like crazy and it causes it to drop off. And as you'll see in a moment, that is very stressful to the system. So there's nothing healthy about cereal at all. Uh, if you look at a book, uh, it was a book written by a guy named Paul A. Stitt, S-T-I-T-T. -T. It's a book that was written in the 1940s and 50s. This guy worked for Quaker, and he was a food scientist. And what they did was they did three studies with rats. One study, they gave the rat as much puff wheat cereal as it wanted. The second uh, control rats, they just gave it water. And the third rat, they shredded up the box and gave it the box. Well, the first ones to die were the ones that eat the puff wheat cereal. The second ones to live the longest were the ones that just got water. And the third ones to uh, live the longest were the ones that ate the, the box. So the moral story is eat the box, not the cereal. <laughs> and you'll be healthier. So there's nothing healthy about cereals. This is the second breakfast that can really do damage uh, within the body. Simple things like yogurt, fruit, cereal, boom, jacks up your blood sugar, and then what ends up happening? Your blood sugar is not happy, and it skyrockets, and then what ends up happening is you are on a roller coaster effect. You're going up and down, up and down, up and down uh, constantly, and that creates an environment that is very stressful to the body because your body thinks of extremes. It always wants to be in the state of homeostasis which just means balance. It just wants to be in balance. The problem is when the blood sugar is driven up like that first thing in the morning, it goes up, and whenever it goes up, it's got to come down. So when it comes down and that process of coming down, that is a very stressful time to the body because the body doesn't want to go too low blood sugar because if you go too low blood sugar, you're going to go into coma and you're going to die. So that's why the body starts mobilizing cortisol to break down muscle tissue, whatever it has to do to raise up your blood sugar to normalize it. 
That's just a natural strategy mechanism of the body. So those types of breakfasts can be really detrimental to really wasting that cortisol. And ultimately what comes down to this is it's false alarms. So let's say, for example, I wanted to pull a trick on everybody, all the over 2,000 people here. So I went out and pulled a fire alarm. Very cool. Firemen come. like, oh, cool. This is cool to see firemen. I've never seen firemen from Australia. See what they look like. See what they wear. Whatever. So I do that. And then they go away. They check out. There's nothing wrong. There's no one hurt. There's no fire. And then I go, let's see what happens again. So I do it again. They come out. I'm like, what the hell? What's going on? And then I'm a real freaking ass. And I do it a third time. Well, what's going to happen to the firefighters? They're going to know either there's a prankster. They're going to get tired, fatigued from constantly coming out. In the same way, when people don't control their blood sugar, they either skip breakfast or they eat the inappropriate foods. That is a false alarm to the body. So what ends up happening is cortisol has to come out and go to the rescue in the same way that the firefighters have to come out and check out everything and, and put the fire out. So what ends up happening is that these false alarms basically deplete cortisol in your body. And cortisol, remember, is a anti-inflammatory hormone. So what's more important? Is it dealing with blood sugar so that someone doesn't go in a coma and die? Or is it dealing with, I don't know, an achy low back with a disc? You can survive with a disc, but you can't if you go in a coma and die. So it prioritizes cortisol to dealing with not the low back with the disc, but with someone who's got blood sugar control issues. So if you start controlling blood sugar with a client, with the proper food and breakfast, you will ultimately deal with inflammation. And I'm not blowing smoke up your ass or anything. It sounds so easy, but I do it every single day in my clinic and my practice. A lot of, unfortunately, a lot of the functional medicine doctors that do the alternative medicine, they give people lots of supplements, but they don't do any of this foundational stuff with lifestyle. This is the, the leg work. This is the lifestyle work that's not so sexy, but it gets the job done, and it does it very, very well. And so ultimately, it's about controlling cortisol, which leads to an anti-inflammatory effect in the body. And if you think back to Mr. Smith who got an injection in his shoulder, what did they inject in his shoulder? It was a cortisone injection. That's cortisone because it has an anti-inflammatory effect. So cortisol is very, very powerful in the body, and you can regulate it which way you want depending on what you're eating. And you'll also see with what you're drinking. And that's why we lead to water consumption. I've done extensive research on water, and what they've shown is that when your body's in a dehydrated state, so when you don't drink enough water, what ends up happening is cortisol levels get dysregulated. That means they just go haywire. But when the people start to drink their minor amount of water, the cortisol starts to normalize. And they get to more of a normal level versus a dysfunctional level. So with water consumption, you want to consume one liter per 30 kilos of body weight. So if you weigh 90 kilos, your goal is to drink one liter of water every single day. That's no ifs, ands, or buts, whether it's raining or whether it's cold. Uh, if it's hot, if you're working with endurance athletes, uh, one of the rule of thumbs that I use is that you weigh the, the, it could be an endurance athlete or a power athlete. If they just profusely sweat, what you may have to do is you weigh them uh, naked on a scale uh, before, and then for every half kilo that they lose, then what you're going to do is you're going to have them hire extra with another half liter of water. That's usually the standard there uh, with water consumption. But don't underestimate water because it can be a very, very powerful therapeutic tool. And to just give you an example, I was lecturing at one of the conferences, and um, probably many of you know Gray Cook. He's a colleague of mine. And we lecture some of the same places. And one of his assistants came up to me and said, hey, Rob, I want to talk to you. And I said, sure, what, you know, what's up? What's going on? He said, hey, I watched your DVD uh, and uh, you know, that Gray showed me. And, I started drinking enough water. I can't believe the results. And I said, well, you know, what happened? He says, well, I've been struggling with massive knee pain and low back pain, and my knee pain, it decreased quite a bit. And I said, well, how much? And uh, he said, 60%, easy. And I said, you didn't do anything else? He goes, no, I, I wasn't able to do anything else. I was, <laughs> the simple thing I could do is just drink more water. Uh, and he said that his knee pain decreased. What we have to realize is with joint pain, 
Remember, we have synovial fluid within the joint. It's lubricated by that synovial fluid. And guess where that comes from? It comes from the water that we're consuming. So we have to properly hydrate our clients, especially with ones with rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, any sort of joint pain. Uh, it's a prophylactic way to deal with that joint pain. If you look at discs, so if you look at an a intervertebral disc, you have the rings around it called the annulus fibrosis. When to the center here is this piece here. That is the nucleus propulsus. That's the center. It's primarily composed of water. So when you go to sleep at night, the disc should fully rehydrate. You should wake up about a centimeter and a half taller in the morning. And then as gravity, you walk around, then it starts to decrease the disc height. But most people don't drink enough water to get that disc height that they need. And the higher disc height, it's a prophylactic way to deal with low back pain, whether it's a disc, whether it's a spondy, whether it's a spinal stenosis, whatever the spinal condition is. With cortisol control, I talked about blood sugar control. So ultimately, the best way to control cortisol to stabilize it and to have some reserve for it to deal with pain and inflammation within the body is eating breakfast. You must eat breakfast in order to stabilize your blood sugar. When you wake up in the morning, it's an interesting environment. It's a clean slate. So whatever you pick and choose to put in your mouth is going to dictate your blood sugar later in the afternoon. It's what we call the second meal effect. So they've done research with diabetics as well as non-diabetics. But I look at the study with the diabetic as more powerful. And what they've shown is that when they feed them breakfast versus skipping that breakfast, the blood glucose control is much better after lunch. So what that means is they're not going to get food coma after lunch. So a lot of your clients say, go, God, I eat lunch, and I just want to take a nap for about an hour at around 1.30 or 2 o'clock. Or it could be 3, 4, 5 o'clock. That's because they either skipped breakfast or they ate the inappropriate breakfast. So whatever you choose to do first thing in the morning is going to dictate what the blood sugar is going to look like and ultimately what your cortisol is going to look like in the remainder of the afternoon. And clinically, I've seen this affect someone's sleep patterns, believe it or not. So when they ate for breakfast, that's the only thing we changed, their sleep patterns improved. And that just only makes sense because you're actually stabilizing blood sugar, ultimately leading to better cortisol control because cortisol has a major impact on someone's sleep patterns. So if someone has issues with sleep, you always have to look at the adrenal glands because that means there's some kind of either dysregulation of the cortisol or there's just not enough cortisol or too much cortisol. Protein shakes. The reason why I put this up is that there's a big push for people to have protein shakes in the morning. I don't have time, this and this and that. Just remember, with all these whey protein shakes, I mean, the first time I think I took a protein shake was in 1988. 89, where they were making these protein shakes. I mean, way before we had all these meal replacements and the whey protein powder. Uh, and the way that they were designed were for pre-exercise or after exercise. Because the whole point of it is liquid, one, it gets into the system fast, it jacks up your insulin level, which supposedly we're trying to get that within muscle cells so that we can recover faster. That's why a lot of us do a protein shake after we train, because it facilitates recovery. But remember, it's causing your glucose, your insulin level to go up. Is that what we want to happen first thing in the morning? No. We want your blood sugar to be flatlined. So we th typically think of flatlining for a heart as a bad thing. In regards to blood sugar, it's a good thing. We want it to be flatlined or slightly rising. That would we keep the blood sugar nice and stable, and we're not having that roller coaster effect, which is really stressful to the body. So protein shakes, I would much rather you fight tooth and nail to get your client to spend another 15 minutes and get up earlier and have a breakfast, eat their breakfast, and then get out the door. I know a lot of you probably work early in the morning, so you're running out the door as you're trying to see that 5.30 client or 6 o'clock client. In order for you guys to start coaching your clients with these recommendations, you have to be doing it yourself. So for me to say to my client, well, I want you to do... Uh, 10 sets of 10 of front squats, then we're going to push the sled, and then we're going to go do the glute ham raise, and then we're going to do some 
abdominal training. If I don't do that myself, how the heck am I going to get my client to do it? They know when you recommend something if you don't do it yourself. So make sure that you start doing this with yourself and all these recommendations with yourself first before you start recommending to their clients. Because then you have first-hand experience of what it feels like and the differences it'll make. Meal times. A lot of people don't put an emphasis on meal times. They should at least have a breakfast, a lunch, and a dinner. Many people work through lunch. They, don't, they just skip lunch, or sometimes they skip breakfast and lunch, and then they eat a huge dinner. And that's just going to only cause further problems. So make sure that people have scheduled eating times because it's a very stressful situation when they don't eat. Their blood sugar starts dropping off, and then that's when they can notice all sorts of issues with um, anxiety, depression. I mean, you heard Matt Church this morning talking about the increased rates of depression. I mean, I've had as young as uh, an 8-year-old on antidepressant medications, and he's been on it for 8 years because he's 16. And all we needed to do was really control his blood sugar. In my opinion, all those different problems with ADD, ADHD, it's a blood sugar control issue. Yes, there may be some other issues involved, but to label a kid as ADD, ADHD, because he wants to run around, um, that's a bad thing. And ultimately, what did he get for breakfast? He got something like Captain Crunch and a Frappuccino. Or he, he, if he's a skateboarder, because I live in a, the mecca of skateboarding in Carlsbad and Encinitas, California, all these kids are sucking down Monster and Red Bulls like it's just water. It's just normal. And then you have them bouncing around, and you go, well, he's got ADD. Well, let's look further into the issue and look at some basic things that these kids are putting in their body as well as adults. We've heard, all heard of the uh, BFF, best friend forever. Well, your best friend for cortisol control is your PFF, which is your protein, your fats, and your fiber. That's always a must in each meal if you want to control blood sugar. If you just have carbohydrates, so you saw on that previous or 10 slides ago with cereal. Cereal and yogurt and granola and fruit is a whopping load of just plain sugar. So when you have plain sugar coming into the system that way, in that amount, it's going to jack up your blood sugar, and then it's going to drop down. So be aware of that. So proteins. I like to use eggs. Eggs are a good source. You can do sausage. You can even do bacon. Um, any of those things help stabilize the blood sugar. Of course, I would always recommend that people try to get free-range organic as much as you can because the quality of the proteins are much higher. Um, steak, beef, buffalo, bison, anything like that is, is always good. Uh, I would have to say that when you look at the type of meat that you're getting, uh, it does make a difference. So with grass-fed beef, you're getting four to five times the amount of omega-3s versus the omega-6 uh, versus grain-fed beef. So it does pay to get the higher quality meat uh, it's going to be healthier for you. And remember I told you before that with inflammation, one of the problems we have with the massive amounts of inflammation within a lot of our clients is the imbalance ratio of omega-6s to the omega-3s. And so when you get people sh shifting to a better quality steak or beef or bison or buffalo, you're getting them to shift more to an anti-inflammatory state by just what they're choosing to buy in regards to uh, their food. So remember that when you're coaching your clients. Say, well, let's just have you try to shop at a certain store that sells you grass-fed beef. Salmon, we know, is a big one, too. So salmon's a great source of omega-3s. But that's in one or one condition if it's wild fish. Unfortunately, nothing is regulated within the fishing industry. So they can give the salmon, the farm salmon, whatever they want to make you grow fat, and nice and big and do all sorts of other things. Uh, unfortunately, what happens is when they started farming salmon, when they got the fish, they filleted it open. It didn't look nice and orange-reddish. It looked gray. Because what they ended up doing is they just fed it soy pellets and corn pellets or whatever else they're feeding it. So there's no omega-3 that are produced within wild fish. So as much as possible, try to get your clients to, to invest in some wild fish, some good quality fish, because the omega-3 content will be higher and ultimately leading to a more anti-inflammatory effect on the body. And the same thing goes with free-range uh, chicken and eggs. If you look at the eggs, if you get a conventionally raised egg, it's probably a 20 to 1 ratio omega-6 to 3. 
versus if you get an organic egg, it's about a one-to-one -one ratio. A really good book to read on that is uh, The Omega Plan by Artemis Simopoulos. You can also look at her research. She's ma the major researcher on the omega-3s, omega-6s. So anything you want to look on omega-3 and 6, it's Artemis Simopoulos. Just Google that. You'll find all her information. And what I like clients to have is about a palm size of protein three times a day. That would be my recommendation. If you have people that are exercising a lot, endurance athletes, uh, strength athletes, that protein intake is going to go up. But in general, even for your client that maybe exercises twice a week, they still need to be doing this uh, palm size of protein uh, three times a day. That's just uh, standard, just for brain function, because you get all your brain food, your neurotransmitters from protein that you eat. People don't realize that you get energy from protein uh, versus just always carbohydrates. And with protein intake, it's a two-for-one deal. So as I said before, with the steak, you're getting protein, but you're also getting the essential fatty acids from that if it's a grain-fed, uh, excuse me, grass-fed uh, steak or beef or bison or buffalo. So think of it as a protein source as a two-for-one effect. And the interesting thing about fat is that fat has been shown to have no influence on your insulin levels. So what they do is they give people glucose, for example, that 50-gram orange drink or purple drink, and you drink it, then they test your blood at 60 minutes and 20 minutes or 120 minutes, and they look at see what your glucose response is. Well, with fat, it's been shown to have no insulin response. So it's really a good way to help stabilize blood sugar. So just don't be afraid of fat. If you're afraid of fat, then come to my lecture. Fat is your friend. <laughs> and you won't be uh, afraid to eat fat anymore. Uh, coconut oil is a very good source of fat to use, especially as an anti-inflammatory fat. One of the ways that it works is it increases IL-10. It's one of the interleukins that has an anti-inflammatory effect on the body. Also, uh, one of the other many benefits of coconut oil is that it's antimicrobial. It just means anti-bug. So anytime you accidentally swallow a bacteria or a parasite or fungus, whatever, it fights that infection. So coconut oil is a very good oil uh, in regards to dealing with inflammation uh, from its properties as well as on a microbiologic effect for the digestive system. Uh, butter is also one too. So butter is a four carbon chain butyric acid and it also has what we call an antimicrobial effect. Not only is it stable, keeps us satiated, but it has an antimicrobial effect. So it does protect your digestive system from the bugs I talked about earlier. So avoid the margarines, avoid the canola oils, the vegetable oils. Use oils that are stable that don't go rancid when you heat them. Olive oil is a good one as well. Uh, I would tend to be more cautious about heating really high heat because it can go rancid. But use it plenty, you know, plenty on your salads, on vegetables, and so forth. Uh, there's what we call squalene in it. It's a nutrient. And it's been shown to put the fire out, so to speak. It's an anti-inflammatory effect in olive oil. So there are some nice benefits to olive oil uh, that you can use with a lot of your clients. But I would avoid definitely oils such as canola oil. Uh, in the manufacturing process, it's an erucic acid. And uh, it, it can have some trans fatty acids in it, depending on how they process it. So just be wary uh, about the canola oils, because there's a big push uh, for people to be using canola oil versus the cottonseed oils and the soybean oil and the corn oils, which most of you know are, once you heat them, they turn into trans fats. Fish oils. So with supplementation, with some of the fish oils, um, just be wary of the quality. So if you don't know about the quality, if you find it in a regular supermarket, be very suspect. Most likely it has mercury and it probably has traces of PCBs. So be careful with the quality. I recommend usually 500 uh, milligram capsules uh, two of those per 20 kilos of body weight uh, as a general just standalone, especially if people have a very processed food diet. Uh, you need about 12 to 16 weeks for that to turn over because ultimately the good fats that people do eat, they will, it'll be like an oil change with your car. It just doesn't happen within a couple minutes, but it happened over weeks at a time. So as you introduce some of these good fats, you'll get some of this oil transfer, this oil change happening and you'll notice inflammation will start to drop off in a lot of the clients and their symptoms will get uh, uh, reduced, along with all the, all the other recommendations we made about water and, and food and, and establishing level blood sugar. Uh, Baragua or fish analysis. 
This is just the, uh, a name for borage oil. So the fatty acid is called gamma linoleic acid. It's an omega-6 fatty acid, and I, I know I said it's pro-inflammatory, but this one is different. It's, it's a special one. So this omega-6 has been shown to be anti-inflammatory in cases of rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, a very good track record, um, as well as uh, for inflammation for a lot of our female clients that time of the month. They're having cramping, bloating, uh, moodiness. I know none of the women get moody at all during their cycle, but sometimes it does happen. But um, they can be very, very beneficial using GLA. And what you can do is you can use one capsule, which is about 240 milligrams, and you use that twice a day. And this is one of the supplements on paper. It looks good. Clinically, it works very, very well. So if you have clients with, you know, RA or osteoarthritis and they're using some powerful meds, just suggest that they get on some of these oils. And I think you'll, at least if you get a 30% improvement, at least they can maybe possibly reduce their, their dosage of the medication, which reduces the amount of side effects that they get over a lifetime. Uh, picture of pineapple. Uh, pineapple has bromelain. It's a proteolytic enzyme. So proteolytic enzymes are very, very good for dealing with inflammation. Oftentimes when people have lots of inflammation going through the blood, they have fibrin, a product. And so what the proteolytic enzymes do is if you take it on the empty stomach, they help to be like a Pac-Man and eat up those fibrin to get rid of them so that inflammation can get reduced over a period of time. Uh, some of the other uh, herbals that you should be aware of is turmeric. Turmeric is very, very anti-inflammatory. Lots of research on joint pain, um, even in cancer these days. So you'll see lots of research on it. Also with Boswellia. Boswellia is also anti-inflammatory, helping with joint pain, as well as having an anti-tumor, anti-cancer effect. And more and more research will come out about it. But you guys know the research now, so you can use these products. Uh, typically, they come separately with the prolytic enzymes versus the herbs. This is one product from Designs for Health, Inflammatone. It's what I classify as a second-generation anti-inflammatory. It's a combination of the prolytic enzymes as well as Boswellia, turmeric, rosemary. It works quite well. Uh, I typically use about three capsules on an empty stomach with a client um, with chronic pain maybe twice a day. If it's really acute, then I recommend they probably take it three to four times a day. Is it going to act exactly like ibuprofen? No. Um, it's not going to work exactly like that. Um, if you have someone with an acute amount of pain, an alternative is to use a homeopathic called Arnica Montana. Uh, you can use it in the pellet form, and you simply put it underneath the tongue. Or there's gels, there's creams. Uh, but all of you should have this in your, snap, your backpack, your briefcase, wherever you go, wherever gym you're at. You never know when you'll get injured you may get a perfect warm-up for whatever reason. You strain your, your QL when you do a deadlift or you're doing a class or your client accidentally hits their head somewhere. Uh, this is something that you can use immediately to deal with pain and inflammation uh, right away. You can use it every 15 minutes if it's real severe and people have lots of pain and inflammation. Uh, so that's a very good, handy, and very inexpensive way uh, to help these people uh, without having to always refer to medication and over-the-counter drugs. One thing I want to talk to you guys about as, a, as one of the last uh, couple slides is about vitamin D. It's an epidemic of lowered amounts of vitamin D within the body. Uh, it's not just in America. It's not just in Australia. No, it's all over the world. Italy, Saudi Arabia. We have an epidemic of lowered vitamin D levels. Uh, most physicians are more aware of it, so they're testing for it. I would say about 90% of the people that I see that I test have lowered amounts of vitamin D. Typically, the levels should be about 30 grams per na uh, nanograms per milliliters, but we're seeing lower levels than that. And one of the reasons is because people are wearing just sunscreen all the time. If you look at the top researcher, Edward Gorham, out of UCSD in San Diego, he talks about how people that should not be in the sun, so our fair-skinned people, should be in the sun, meaning they need to get on the sun, not till they're a lobster and they're burnt, but they need to get a little bit of sun, maybe slightly pink, and then they stop. And they get out of the sun, take a break, put a hat on, put a shirt on. But we need to get that vitamin D production, but we don't with sunscreens. So that's the unfortunate thing. If you're going to be out in the sun for hours of time, of course you would do that. Uh, one website you should write down, uh, ewg.org. It's called the Environmental Working Group. They're a very good group that gives you uh, alternatives for non-toxic sunscreens, non-toxic makeups, non-toxic cleaning supplies, all sorts of other things if you want to get educated on that. 
at environmentalworkinggroup.org. So if you just type in ewg.org, uh, they have all sorts of information. Uh, try to donate to them because they do need information. They're a nonprofit organization. Uh, so it just helps their cause, and they, they fought, fight um, GMO and all sorts of other uh, you know, pressing issues about our food supply as well. With vitamin D, if you see up here, we, you have the sun right here, and you see how it says seven dehydrocholesterol. People don't know this, but you have, absolutely must have cholesterol to make your vitamin D. And in my presentation, fat is your friend. You have to have cholesterol to make your hormones. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Unfortunately, most people are put on a statin medication to lower their cholesterol because if you eat a piece of bacon, you're going to have a heart attack and die. And that's not true. Uh, and you'll, you'll know that more in that lecture. But to say the least, we need sun. We do need cholesterol for vitamin D. Um, you can't convince your client of all that one time. But what you can do is at least go, have them go to their doctor, get tested. And what they should be tested for is their 25-hydroxy vitamin D uh, level. And that'll tell them where they're at. And they should be uh, at about 50 to 80 nanograms per ml. Uh, and that's... Uh, yeah, so you want to get 25 OHD. That's what they're getting tested on. And what they're going to be looking for is shooting for 50 to 80 nanograms per ml. That's the optimal uh, level that they want to be at. Um, otherwise, their levels are too low. And what they're showing is that with vitamin D, it's integrated in, in every single cell of your body. So it has a capacity to deal with inflammation on a systemic level, on a whole body level. Uh, these are my uh, social media. So if you want to get linked up and connected, Robert Yang Inc., uh, at Robert Yang Inc. on Twitter, uh, tweet me. I'll respond to you guys. Uh, my time is closing with you guys, but I want to leave you with a few thoughts. We talked about the plantar fasciitis, colitis, diverticulitis. It could be thyroiditis. Remember, whenever you see the ITIS, it's a sign of inflammation. That does not mean they have a deficiency of acetaminophen, or ibuprofen. That means that you guys as coaches, as fitness professionals, need to give your clients the information. And remember, it's very simple. It's simply hydration, one liter per 30 kilos of body weight. Get them to eat breakfast, stabilize their blood sugar. Get them maybe to use a few supplements. And you'll be well on your way to helping your clients with less pain as well as less inflammation. Thanks very much, guys, for listening. I'll be in the back uh, or down here to answer any questions. Thanks so much to Robert for today's presentation. Just a quick reminder, if everyone can please fill in their evaluation forms before they head out the door and just hand them to the event crew on the way out. Thanks very much.